An offering to Poseidon. The Greeks are praying for a safe return home. I hope the sea god spits in their offering. Let's them all drown at the bottom of the sea. This is a gift. We should take it to the temple of Poseidon. I think we should burn it. Burn it, my prince. It's a gift to the gods. Father, burn it. In my previous vlog, I explained why and how social networks have become unsafe for those who are most vulnerable. When social networks came to prominence in the social media golden age between 2002 and 2012, there was excitement and optimism about the future of human relationships and connections. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram brought such enthusiasm because it was easier than ever to keep in touch with your friends and family. Before the internet, we used to send letters that could take days or weeks to arrive, and we'd have to spend our weekends on the phone with them. But then, social networks came. And all of a sudden, we just opened our laptops and our smartphones, and there they were. We could know what they were doing, what they were thinking, where they were. Everything seemed to be set up for better more frequent and more meaningful connections with those who were physically distant from us. And we got some of that. We're sharing more content with each other, we're expressing ourselves, we're launching more or less effective movements like the Arab Spring, the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, the ALS Challenge, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and so many more. So yeah, all these movements don't happen if you don't have social media. And many of them were positive. But we also got a lot of other negative and toxic consequences. Here are just a few examples where we are worse off than those of our predecessors who did not use social networks. First, addiction. Social networks are known to encourage and foster addictive behaviors. People used to actually be able to live without a phone before and still feel fulfilled in life. We are the first generation of mankind that spends as much time as we do staring at a screen. I personally spend an average of eight hours a day, apparently, looking at my smartphone. And we're so addicted that the thought of spending a week without our smartphones would terrify most of us. Then we have distraction. Our generation is probably one of the most distracted of all time. Our attention span is already so much smaller than it used to be for previous generations. Apparently, it was actually 12 seconds in 2000, and now it's like 8.25 seconds, which is less than that of a goldfish. And it's probably not getting better anytime soon. I am from the generation that got their first smartphone as teenagers, and I'm struggling big deal with my attention span. But my younger brother is from the generation that got their first iPad when they were probably 5 or 6. He and his fellow Gen Zers might have a harder time than my fellow millennials reading a book for two to three hours straight, for example. Distraction is dangerous because it diverts us from our life goals, from the emotional and physical needs of those around us, and it deprives us of proper sleep. And then we have cyberbullying. I talked about this in my previous vlog. This is by far the worst aspect of social media. So many people have suffered over the years because of trolls or malicious users attacking and bullying them, or a family member or a friend. The impact of cyberbullying on mental health and safety is difficult to measure, but we've all seen the tears and the pain. Most of us have felt disgusted with what social networks do to us. And there are so many other problems with social media such as lack of privacy, disinformation, fear of missing out, inauthenticity, what did we gain in exchange for all these generational scourges? Are we more connected to each other? Do we feel closer to one another? Do we tolerate or understand each other better? Are we more mature in our ability to relate than the generations that came before us? Do we trust each other more? I think you know the answer to this question. We might actually be as divided as ever. Just in the past five years, we've seen the internet become the stage of aggressive antagonism and frantic outrage. 
But you know what makes it worse? Social networks probably felt good about all that. Writer Gia Tolentino was helpful to me. When I tried to understand the dynamics between social networks and controversial, outrage-provoking content. In Trick Mirror, her book, she writes, Having a mutual enemy is a quick way to make a friend. We learned this as early as elementary school. And politically, it's much easier to organize people against something than it is to unite them in an affirmative vision. And within the economy of tension, conflict always gets more people to look. And this is the most shocking part of it all. Social networks actually profit from the divisions and conflicts and controversies online. They profit from opposition. For individuals and communities, all these elements are toxic and destructive. But for big corporations, that's just how you make money. The reality of social networks is that they might not simply ignore the dynamics and principles necessary for healthy communities. They might actually be choosing to put them aside in order to be more profitable. I explained earlier why I thought Mark Zuckerberg's greatest mistake, the one that condemned Facebook, his social network, happened in 2006 when he decided to open the network to everyone at least 13 years old with a valid email address. It used to be restricted to Ivy League college students. And then on September 26, 2006, everyone could get in. The paradox of this decision is that on one hand, it set Mark Zuckerberg on the path to become a billionaire. But on the other hand, it killed Facebook. Facebook was not primarily a software product. Facebook was a community. That community, along with everything that made it worth being part of, has been dead for over a decade now. Once trust died, the community died. And Facebook too. But I keep talking about this community thing and you might be annoyed by now with me sounding so deep and profound. Well, let me take this from a more down-to-earth angle. What is a community in the first place? Merriam-Webster has a rich definition for a community. A community is a unifying body of individuals such as A. The people with common interests living in a particular area. B, a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. C, a body of persons of common and especially professional interest scattered through a larger society. D, a body of persons or nations having a common history or common social, economic, and political interests. E, a group linked by a common policy. F, an interacting population of various kinds of individuals, such as species, in a common location. Believe me, my purpose with this vlog is not to read a dictionary to you. I just want you to observe a pattern here. No matter what it is you mean by community, there is always a concept of something in common, something shared, something that links different people together. It could be a specific location, or it could be having a common history, or common interest, or joint ownership. But how do you go from something in common to actual trust? Well, let me give you an example. When I meet a stranger, I'm usually polite and try to be as kind as I can be. But I do not trust them right away, and I hope you don't either. As a matter of fact, I might not trust them ever. For my own safety, I probably will keep my distances and stay on my guard. But as soon as they tell me they love soccer, and that they are fans of my favorite team, which is Paris Saint-Germain, I can't help it. I start wondering if I should not invite them over to watch a game or something. Because we have that one thing in common, because we support the same team, there are experiences we know we already share. We probably both exulted after our amazing victory against Barcelona in 2017. And maybe we both cried bitterly after a painful defeat during the 2020 Champions League final. We might have never met, but trust occurs naturally. I start wanting him to succeed in whatever he's doing, and he probably wants the same for me. Obviously, it doesn't always feel that way. PSG fans can be weird sometimes. But you get the idea. Once you know you have the same interests as someone, you want to trust them. A community is built around a common interest or common wealth. And that community survives and thrives as long as that common wealth is maintained. Communities that are incapable of protecting their common wealth won't survive very long. Protecting a community means two things. First, 
you need to be able to identify and sanction individuals that threaten the commonwealth. Some of the most dangerous, fatal threats to a community comes from the inside. Maybe a member turned malicious or an intruder managed to make it into the community. Whatever the scenario, the threat must be detected and neutralized. Of course, the community must ensure that it is done transparently and justly so that no one is punished undeservedly, but it must be done. Otherwise, the community will suffer and everyone loses. But the second thing necessary is the right invitation protocol. Not everybody should be included in most communities. It sounds cruel, but it's just how reality works. I'll prove it to you. The first community you've ever been part of is your family. And in order to join your family, you had to be trusted and invited. As a matter of fact, at least two people needed to trust and invite you, and that would generally be your father and your mother. But everyone else in the family probably had to welcome you in some way. Obviously, there are exceptions, but I think you get the idea. And then, after you are welcomed in your family, you have to get into school, or church, or clubs, or work. And whenever you do, you have to be vetted, tested, and ultimately invited. Heck, I'm in Canada right now, but I wasn't born here. I had to immigrate. I had to do so legally. And what that means in simple terms is that I was invited by the Canadian government after they decided I could be trusted to come in. And I'm very thankful they did. That's how community grows. You don't just decide to get in. You need to get invited by those who are already in. And until you get invited, you stay outside. Can I trust someone because they've been invited in my community? Well, yeah, at least in principle. If you know that there is a proper invitation protocol, that people are properly tested before they make it into the community, you can reasonably assume that the person you just met within your community will protect the common interest of that community. It doesn't always work that way. People sometimes let in people or things they should not. One of my favorite myths is Homer's Iliad and the account of the Trojan horse. Let them all drown at the bottom of the sea. This is a gift. We shall take it to the temple of Poseidon. I think we should burn it. Burn it, my prince, it's a gift to the gods. Father, burn it. I think there will always be Trojan horses. People with wrong intentions will make it in. But if you apply the proper invitation protocols, it drastically decreases the risks. Notice my social network applies the two pillars of online safety. I explained in my previous vlog how the strike system helps the community identify harmful individuals and protect itself from them. Another feature we have on notice is the invitation only policy. This is our premise. If no trusted member of the network trusts you to join the network, then we don't trust you either. What that means is that we don't let you sign up unless someone who's already in invites you. As a notice network member, you have invitation rights. You can go into the menu, network, and press invite someone. This will generate a unique code that you can share with anyone you would like to join. Once this person enters the code in the final registration screen, they can join the network. We do monitor invitations though. What that means is that the more you invite accounts who have a harmful or inappropriate behavior, the higher your chances of losing your invitation rights. This is probably the most challenging policy I've had to apply, not because it's technically difficult, but because it would slow down our growth. But unlike what Mark Zuckerberg did in 2006, letting everyone in and removing the trust dimension of Facebook, we chose to prioritize trust. Zuckerberg said that his vision was to connect people, but he never specified connecting them to do what. I decided that my vision is to connect people so they can trust each other more. 
I decided that community was more important than money. And I am determined to stand by my decision, no matter what it costs me or notice. A social network is not about profit primarily, it's about people. Now, I do hope to make profit. Who knows, I might become a billionaire too. I'm not going to act like it doesn't matter to me. But if I can't get people to trust each other more, all the money in the world would mean nothing to me. As a matter of fact, I would probably be ashamed of it. Profit must be a byproduct of the trust within notice, always. I believe the future of the internet, just like the future of mankind, is bright. I choose to bet on it. I am not going to stack up food or build a bunker to prepare for World War III. But what I've learned from my parents is that a bright future doesn't happen automatically. You have to make difficult decisions for it and you have to work hard for it. This is it for this vlog. I hope it was helpful or interesting to you. Thanks for watching. Cheers.